specific prayer requests this week? None. Continue for Sherry McCutcheon, we mentioned last week. Okay. Any others? No new news this week? It's Wina. All right, any any other ones? Okay, if not, would you bow with me, please? Our Father in Heaven, we thank you so much for giving us today, and we thank you for allowing us to come together tonight and uh, to study your Word, Father. And Father, we have so much to thank you for. We have so many things uh, going on uh, at this congregation, and you've blessed them, and You've blessed the, the people who are here at the congregation and you've, you've healed people uh, from so many different ailments. And most of all, Father, you've forgiven us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And tonight, uh, Father, we pray that you would be with a couple of people uh, in particular, but in general, Father, we have uh, many in our congregation that are sick and dealing with different afflictions, and we pray that you would remove those from those people. But in particular, Father, we pray pray for Sherry McCutcheon, who's dealing uh, with uh, brain cancer, and we pray for Wina Beal, who is recovering uh, from shoulder surgery, Father. Father, we pray that you would be with us as we open your word tonight, and we pray uh, that uh, our study will produce fruit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so this week uh, we had asked that everybody read Matthew's chapter... Matthew chapters 1 and 2, uh, and next week uh, the chapters we will, we will go no further than chapters 3 and 4. So uh, if you read chapters 1 and 2 this week, great. If you didn't, read chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 uh, for next week, okay? And before we begin, Patty Bill stopped me in the hall, and she has a Matthew fun fact that you're going to tell us about the book of Matthew, right? Okay. I have this little book it's called um, you can't have a different Bible, but know your Bible and it has the author and facts and things. And it says that Matthew is the only gospel that mentions the terms church and kingdom of heaven. And the internet backs it up. So All right. <laughs> so yeah. All right. That's like the, you know, I read a quote earlier this week and it said uh, that everything that is written on the internet is true, Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> so, all right. That's pretty good. Okay. So Robert um, tonight is going to start covering uh, the the other part of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, or the I, I should say the behind the scenes. Last week we covered a lot about who Matthew was, uh, and you know the, the area uh, that he was writing from. So Robert. I'll turn say, it over to you. You want me to just put my next chart up so you can yeah. talk to, to that? So Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> so um, we talked about all this last week. We talked about Matthew the man. Uh, we stated that, that, you know, one of my personal beliefs is that it's, it's highly likely that he knew uh, the others, that, at least a few of the others that were chosen by Jesus. Uh, he had two names, Matthew and Levi. He was a tax collector. Uh, and he had, and this one was was one of the things I enjoyed about the class last week. I had never thought about until Robert brought it up that he actually had two radical life changes. One was as a Jew when he became a tax collector. What did we say happened to him when he did that? He was outcast completely. And then when he gave up the tax collector life uh, to follow Jesus. Um, and then we, you know, I did the at the beginning class. I did the silly little example where I was trying to illustrate the importance of context uh, and perspective, where I threw up the silly phrase, and then as, pe as I gave more information, it was clear what I was saying when I said the uh, silly phrase. And as I mentioned, that's uh, our reading assignment for next week. So, Any questions or comments? Any thoughts from last week? Things that were covered? Anybody discover any other interesting facts? Those were... We're very good. I didn't catch the one about the the church, but 
We're going to continue with the thought of context and perspective. Spend a little more time on that. Uh, not just because it's a gospel that we're talking about and studying this quarter, but because of the fact that it's placed as the first book in the New Testament. And so it's coming right after you know, the end of prophecy and what's been revealed in the Old Testament scriptures. And there's a period between there that I want us to spend a little bit of time. So a little more perspective on Matthew the, to support his writing style. Things I want us to notice as we start into the scripture. And then we'll talk about this time period between the, the Testaments before we get into chapter 1 and 2. And let me say up front, Raise your hand, speak up, ask a question. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff to try to cover tonight. If we don't get through it, we'll pick back up next week. We won't worry about that. But I would like for us to read parts of chapter 1 and 2 together. Uh, it's going to be very familiar, and we're going to hit the highlights, mentioning some specific interesting topics. And if you have others, mention those. But we're going to read it quickly. It's, it's very clear and going to be very familiar to you. So, So from the... The perspective of Matthew, we talked a little bit about his, his primary audience uh, is a Jewish audience. And as such, it's going to be folks that are very familiar with the Old Testament. And we'll touch in how, how that plays into that gap between the Testaments. But uh, these people that he's trying to reach and teach are going to be very familiar with all Old Testament scripture because they had that at this time and Moses and the prophets, and to the point of his use of prophecy and references to the Old Testament is excessive compared to, to other books. Primary goal and objective was to demonstrate that to that Jew, Jewish audience that, that Jesus was indeed the son of David, the son of Abraham, who is the Christ, the Messiah, as foretold by the, the prophecies that we read about. And he starts his book out with that very statement, in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. So it's very clear what he's trying to, to accomplish here. He intended to show that Jesus of Nazareth was the long-awaited Messiah that, that all these Jewish folks have been waiting for, and that he is the rightful king. That's another important thing. There are some constraints to that that these Jewish people who know the Scripture are going to be looking for. He wanted to show that Jesus fulfilled these prophecies um, that were about Him from long ago that were recorded in, in Scripture. And as I mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about bridging that gap between the Old and New Testaments. A little bit about Matthew's Gospel compared to the other synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we're, most of us are familiar with what the, uh, the term synoptic gospels sets them a little bit apart from the gospel of John. But uh, synoptic just, just means to see together or have a common view, which makes a lot of sense when you consider Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They cover a lot of the same events that deal with uh, the life of Jesus, his ministry, actually his birth and life, death, resurrection. Uh, and all those aspects. Associated with his Jewish audience focus in Matthew, Marx was geared a little more toward a Roman audience, a little broader for that time frame following the, the quiet period. Marx is the actually the shortest, and it's a little more action-oriented. If you'll notice the, the text and the way Mark writes, he actually uses the term immediately several times in his gospel. Reads a lot like a story compared to the other two. And then Luke's more geared toward a, an audience of, of Gentiles, which makes a lot of sense. We're covering all the bases with those gospels to tell this common story. Luke's is the longest. It's very historic in nature. And it's very thorough. And then John's audience and his is broad with a uh, very persuasive because of his stated uh, intent was to get people to believe that Jesus is the Christ. 
Continuing on in the style of Matthew, he did use extensive Old Testament references. You can count them differently. Some of them, there's different types of references, not all direct prophecies that were fulfilled, but there's 80 plus references uh, in his book, which is more than any other New Testament book. Really, it's only exceeded by some of the Old Testament prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah. You're going to find when we start reading it, or as you've been reading, you may not realize how almost every verse, every other sentence has a, some reference to the Old Testament. So, Robert, can I jump in there? Absolutely. I'm, I'm curious if anybody remembers, uh, you know, last week I made uh, the same point. Is, does anybody remember... The, when I was making the point about uh, how many prophecies there were, why I found that interesting that it was Matthew that did that. Does anybody remember that? I don't. That one? He, he, was, a, he was a Jew and then having... Uh, right. ...going off and then yeah. basically, uh, you know, uh, join up with the Romans to be a tax collector and then having come back to that slightly that there was no source of... Yeah, yeah, and we had a so a couple of us had a little short conversation afterwards uh, that I had not thought about as well. Is it also says something about Matthew that uh, number one, uh, he like I said, he's done that much, uh, I believe, personal study, and then he's putting that in his book, and then after uh, uh, Jesus died and was resurrected, he ministered to the Jews, so he ministered to the very people uh, that hated him. Right. Uh, and I, that that's for me that that just over and over when I study Matthew, I always keep that uh, in the back of my mind. Very good. Another little interesting thing that I noted was it, it it's very similar to uh, the 77 items that are mentioned in Genesis uh, that are, are prophecy related or predictive in nature. First book of the Old Testament, first book of the New Testament. Just an interesting point. One of the interesting emphases that he makes in terminology is Christ the King. That's who he's trying to convince that the Jews is coming. And that's somewhat unique uh, to Matthew's verbiage and, and way of teaching. And he follows that up with his content about that right to that throne and that kingship. And Patty mentioned another thing unique to his gospel is that he, he uses the term kingdom of heaven where the others will use kingdom of God. Why? Does anybody happen to, to know or suspect? There's some thought that it may have been his deep Jewish roots and reaching out to those people there the terminology in that time was, they were sensitive. They were very reverent to these words and terms that they use. So it, it could have been that he was trying to avoid overuse of kingdom of God and and any connotation that would come along with that. I don't, I don't have any proof of this, but I know uh, it may, brings to my mind, you know, the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. So that might have also been, since he's writing to the Jewish audience, he's talking about the place where we're going to go when we are resurrected. And the Sadducees, you know, would have said, no, that's, that's not going to happen. So that, again, I've got no proof of that, but that came to mind as, as I was thinking about that. Yeah, I don't think we'll ever know for sure why, but it is unique to Matthew's gospel. <laughs> Okay, I mentioned talking a little bit between the, the Testaments, between uh, those books of the Bible. Has anybody studied that extensively or that gap of about 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Just curious. There's a lot of interesting information that, that helps set the stage um, for Matthew's Gospel. I'm going to read through a summary. We're going to spend a little bit of time. Just I'm not hitting every ruler, every empire, because there was a lot of change over those centuries. We're kind of going to start at the beginning 
and get to the end and try to hit a summary of the things that are pertinent uh, to Israel at that time. But it's roughly 400 years uh, from the time that the events recorded in the Old Testament uh, to the time that Jesus came to earth. Some people call it the intertestamental period, but years of silence is what a, a lot of folks refer to it. it. And let's put yourself in that environment during that 400 years. Can you imagine um, being prior to that time with the, the scripture being revealed and recorded and, and uh, over this time we're going to see that it was translated, but 400 years with really, you know, no word from God, no prophecy. Put that sort of in perspective. Wanda mentioned when we were talking about this the other night that think about how old the United States is. 250-ish years old. And it's really hard for us to imagine it not being here from our little window of life here. But imagine 400 years. Um, it would be a hard perspective to, to imagine. So the Old Testament closed out with the return of the Israelites from the Babylonian exile. And they were told to go back to their, their own land. And this, was, this came from the Persian king Cyrus after he conquered Babylon. That's the only reason they got to to go back to their, their home. And then Ezra and Nehemiah recorded some of this. Uh, that return to their home happened in waves. There was a series of waves that began in about 540 B.C. to 420 B.C. And the first wave was under uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua, the priest, and they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, decades later, the, the wall of the city was rebuilt. And by that time, the teaching of the law of Moses was reestablished. Civil authority was re reorganized. Uh, and Malachi wrote about this in some final prophetic words that were recorded in the Old Testament. Throughout this period, Israel was a minor province uh, in a Persian empire, which was a far cry from what they were used to throughout Old Testament times uh, when Israel was strong and powerful under very powerful kings. They remained under Persian rule for another century until about 331 B.C. And until that time was when Alexander Great, the Great came on the scene and he built a, a tremendous empire when he came in the, the 330 B.C. time frame. Built a, an empire and a kingdom that, that spread over a lot of land mass. He is the one responsible for introducing the Hellenistic Greek culture, if you will, which was heavily based in philosophy, religion, uh, and language throughout that territory. After Alexander the Great's death at age 33, very young, the empire was divided into a, a handful of, of his leaders that were under him. That land is now called Palestine or Judea. And that process of Hellenization that instilled that, that Greek culture over time reached a bit of a tip, tipping point. And at one point when uh, Antichus the Fourth Epiphanes, and you've heard some of these rulers, desecrated the temple in Jerusalem, and that was sort of a breaking point for the, the Jewish people in that time. That led up to the, the Maccabean period. A lot, a lot of us have heard that and know bits and pieces about the Maccabees and their revolt. And they actually became an independent Judean state in about 142 B.C. So you can kind of get a feel for the time frame leading up. Let's see. Uh, Judea reached its largest extent incorporating Samaria, Galilee, and regions east of the Jordan River and, and the Dead Sea. So it's starting to sound a little more like the New Testament time. But for a brief moment, the Jews were on the verge, uh, or felt like they were on the verge of uh, that promised messianic kingdom 
because they had their independence back, which they had not had in 300 years. Mm -hmm. But those leaders turned out not to be as, as pure as they thought. Kingdom was small and it was riven with, as you might expect, political and religious division. And uh, that independence ended at 63 BC. Then in 37 BC was when the Romans conquered and came on the scene with Herod the Great. Uh, some of the things during that period, the Greek and Aramaic replaced Hebrew as a common spoken language. Uh, let's see, part of the Israelites longed to stay in, that's not right. I skip down to the time in the foreign captivity back to the Babylonian had cured the Jewish people of their idol worship, uh, which was one of the sins that put them in exile to begin with, why God sent them there. But they rededicated themselves during this time, uh, back to the, the 60s or so BC. They began obeying the law and teaching the, the scriptures, but uh, interpretations began to, to waver, heavily affected by political, socioeconomic type uh, nature of the, the land at that time. And that's where we wound up falling out with our, our five political uh, religious factions, that being, you mentioned earlier, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Herodians, and the Zealots. We won't go into detail about them, but the Jews were still scattered about the, the Mediterranean and the Near East, so there weren't large concentrations of them. Um, a lot of political instability, uh, which made temple worship difficult. Instead of, you know, we, the temple worship was typically at least two uh, treks that you made uh, for sacrificial type worship a year. That changed a little bit over this time period uh, with the development of synagogues. And synagogue, that term in Greek means to, to bring together. So you can imagine these synagogues start popping up because people can't travel a long way to get to the temple. Allowed them to worship in non-sacrificial formats more locally. Along with the synagogue came the Sanhedrin. And that name came from the Hellenistic Greek background and has a meaning of sitting together, assembly or council. And you know, we've all heard about this, the Sanhedrin and talked about it, but where and when did it come from? That was a court that was made up of priests and elders and they were to administrate political, legislative and judicial matters. Their role was to oversee Jewish culture and religious affairs. affairs. This is when the scribes, the elders, and the rabbis arose as uh, leading scholars uh, across all the land. So beginning in about 275 BC, the Hellenistic Jews and scholars translated, as I mentioned earlier, the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And that's a key part leading up to, were you getting ready to mention well, that? Well, I want, I want to jump in there. Go ahead. So, so Romans chapter 5, verses... Uh, six through eight, it says, uh, I'm only going to read six. This is for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, when I was younger, I was always uh, taught and asked the question I'm about to ask you guys. Why was it the right time? Based on everything Robert just said, why was that the right time for Jesus to die? What was going on geopolitically with what he just said? So it's not something in the scripture, but what, what was happening? The Jews had gone back, right? And we've now had this conqueror, Alexander the Great, who's come through. He's built roads and he standardized the language. Okay? So what's that going to allow to happen after Jesus dies? Gospel, the spread of the word. Um, that to me is really, really interesting. You know, when you think about, because if you think about now, right? Well, what, what, if, what if God had waited and it was now? I mean, we have mass communication. We have all this different stuff. But no, no, Scripture says that was the right time, you know. So, yeah, Ed. One of the things that uh, kind of 
what I think is, we're saying is about the right time to start falling into place. Uh, the Romans were a mighty military machine, and they could they created a unified uh, empire from the, from the Atlantic Ocean almost all the way into Mesopotamia and stuff like that. And so there's this big, huge bunch of land that you could travel all over it without exactly. too much impediment. And they and spoke the same language. And very same language uh, and all that kind of stuff. The other thing was that the Romans wanted to hold on to their, their conquest. And so one of the things that, that happened was that um, uh, they built these roads to move their legions quickly all over the empire. And they built huge fleets to be able to move their army all over the Mediterranean Sea. Well, uh, kind of two things happened to the Roman Empire because of that. First one, and I have to say leading into this first one was that uh, I'm an economist. So. <laughs> So one of the things that the roads did in, in, in economics, roads and transportation were very important. So the Romans created, a, through their military roads, a tremendous amount of trade. So there was a great amount of movement of people, of goods, and services, and that's one of the reasons that the Roman, Roman Empire became so powerful and it lasted so long. But it also became very rich. But through those roads and all that kind of stuff, the gospel could be spread very quickly throughout the whole Roman world, from the Atlantic Ocean down into Mesopotamia, and you know, further out into Africa and all that kind of place. So, in that, in a way, that's the right time when you had political stability uh, over a huge amount of land. You had easy transportation by sea and by land, and all that stuff. So, it was a great time to be spreading the gospel. Right. Another thought to that. Do you think the Jews recognized that at that time? They might have recognized the ability to have a copy of, you know, of Old Testament scripture that we could all read together and understand and communicate. But coming out of that 400 years, I don't know that we would see that. And leading up to that tremendous development were a lot of bad guys and a lot of instability that got to that point. So, you can kind of see it coming together in our time now. Yeah. The pieces fit together. So that's a good way to wrap up that 400 years. That was a good discussion. I threw a lot out there. I know it's a lot to, to even try to hear and understand, much less digest, but I wanted us to set that perspective. I'll writing. throw out while you're going to the next slide. Uh, David Morrison did a really great class last quarter on uh, the minor prophets and covered some of this material. So he's a good resource if you're interested in that. And then uh, I don't see Adam Beard in here, but years ago, Adam Beard did a class where he covered the five different uh, sects of yeah. Judaism uh, that you, you brought up. So if you get a chance and you want to ask uh, Jason, or why did I say Jason? Adam about that. Uh, he's another great resource. Okay, any questions or comments? We're going to jump on now to chapters one and two and try to read some of that together and, and mention some interesting points, interesting facts. Um, I want us to read the genealogy. I know <laughs> it, it's painful. It's a test of pronouncing names, but if I could get somebody to read, uh, let's split it up into to two sections. Somebody read one through nine. <coughs> And then somebody else pick up it at verse 10. Don't try to read it fast, but let's listen to the, the words that are used in this genealogy. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac, Isaac fathered Jacob, and Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Judah fathered Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron, and Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amenadab, Amenadab fathered Nathan, and Nathan fathered Sammy. Sammy fathered Bo Boaz by Rahab, Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth, and Obed fathered Jesse. Jesse fathered David the king. David fathered Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon fathered Rehoboam, Rehoboam fathered Abijah, and Abijah fathered Asa. Asa fathered Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat fathered Joram, and Joram fathered, fathered Isaiah. 
Isaiah followed Jotham, and Jotham followed Ahaz, and Ahaz followed Hezekiah. Okay, I'm going to read the rest of these because I just got notification they can't hear us at home. So I'll, I'll read uh, from, okay. from 9 on. Uh, was there something you wanted to interject there? No. Okay, so uh, Isaiah fathered Jotham. Jotham fathered Ahaz, and Ahaz fathered Hezekiah. Hezekiah fathered Manasseh. Manasseh fathered Ammon, and Ammon, Ammon fathered Josiah. Josiah fathered Jeconah and his brothers at the time of the deportation, deportation to Babylon. After the de deportation to Babylon, Jeconia fathered Shealtiel. Shealtiel fathered Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel fathered Abihud. Abihud fathered Eliakim, and Eliakim fathered Azor. Azor fathered Zadok. Zadok fathered Achim. Achim fathered Eliad. Eliad fathered Eleazar. Eleazar fathered uh, Mathen, and Mathen fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called uh, the Messiah. You want me to keep reading? or is that Yeah, it? go ahead and read that last. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now, I want to ask a question here because this is something uh, later on uh, we, we may end up talking about. Uh, or if you you'll be in a class with me someday and you'll hear me talk about this, whose genealogy was this? Jesus, but through who? Yeah, through Joseph. Okay, I think it's Mark. Is it the same genealogy? No. Whose is it? It's Mary's. Any idea why that occurred, or why that's important? It was actually born. <laughs> well, yes, but also. They, they, the Jews actually, in response to Christianity, they changed tribal affiliation. So, in when Jesus was born, your tribal affiliation came uh, through your, I think it was came through your father, and then after Jesus, they swapped it because they didn't want him to be able to have have a claim to the throne, and it had to come through your mother. So that's why there are two genealogies, and it's showing that through both. Parents, he was uh, lineage of David. So well, the, the primary point that I would like to make out of that that would be easy to be drawn into. I've got two genealogies in back-to-back -back books. Is that a conflict in the Bible? It'd be real easy to go there. And and we as Christians need to, to understand and be able to respond to that. That that no, it's not a conflict. It's actually complementary proof that he is the Messiah and that he has the right lineage to have that right to the throne. It, it, interesting. I, I thought of this this week. I'm glad you brought that up. So last week we talked about that Matthew is called Matthew in his gospel, but every other gospel he's called Levi. Isn't that correct? He's called both in other gospels. Okay. He's the only one who does not refer to himself as Levi. Right. And there are people that point to that, again, that is a conflict, okay? And as silly as it sounds, you know what hit me last week is I call Robert Papa. He calls himself Robert. You get what I'm saying? So if I'm writing a book, I might talk about Papa. If he's writing a book, he might talk about Robert. And okay. now you have the content. Context, so you'll know who David's talking about. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that was a point that I, I wanted to make, and it helps us understand why I start this book off with a genealogy. We, we tend to, in our reading and our habits, oh, it's that genealogy with all those hard-to-pronounce names. If you dig into the names, as painful as you might think it is, there are subtleties in there that will jump out at you. Uh, is there anything up here we haven't covered? He, I, I like one. that one. I, he I does want to talk start about his genealogy one. with Abraham. And where does Mark start his? I think he starts all the way back with Adam back and Eve. Adam. Yeah. And it is through through Mary and not starting point as well as the details are complementary. We covered that. Uh, some genealogies mention women, but there's quite a few women mentioned yeah. in this one. Uh, 
uh, any of the women jump out at you that are mentioned in there? Rahab, why Rahab? Well, she was a Gentile, but she was also a prostitute. Yeah. Uh, and then the other one uh, that's interesting, that's always interesting to me is, is Ruth. That when you think about uh, Ruth being the, let me make sure I get this right. Ruth was Dave, King David's grandmother. And, you know, for me, when I read Ruth, that makes Ruth really kind of, kind of come alive uh, as well. Another thing you might notice if you study, and I'm not saying that, that I do or have, I learned a lot of this stuff studying for this class. Nobody will learn more in this class than me. Uh, but it's a well-known practice. I didn't realize that. And if you read this genealogy that Matthew recorded, there's some gaps there. You, if, you, if you look back and compare to, to Old Testament, you'll see there are gaps. And there's also some in Mark's genealogy. But that's... Uh, Luke. Luke's. Am I saying... Okay. Thank you for correcting that. But that was a, a thing that I... I <laughs> couldn't find it when you were looking through Mark. Uh, yeah, one example of that, when, when this one jumps from Rahab to David, that was a 300-year period. So you had to miss some generations. Um, same thing in Joram to Uzziah. And the end of the genealogy I thought was interesting, which is necessary. Um, let's read that. You know, you come down through this, and, and it's all the father of, the father of, in verse 15. And then you get to 16, and it's, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. It's a detail that's necessary to fit with the rest of the story, right? He's not the true not the earthly father. father. But still, that custom, he has a right to the, the throne and Jewish practices. Okay. Any other comments on this genealogy? We spent a lot more time there than, than I meant to, but uh, it should open our eyes to the importance. In, in the Jewish culture, the number seven is a number of completeness. It's interesting that two times seven is the 14 generations in between each of the groupings. That's another good point. If, if you count the names in this genealogy, one is used twice <laughs> to make those numbers fit. Is, is, is that just a Jewish practice to f help facilitate memory? Some of the things I read, you know, that's another question that that genealogy begs. But it does fit with Jewish history and practice. Thank you for bringing that up. I'd forgotten about that part of it. So let's let's look at, at this set of, of verses and some of the prophecy. He's going to reign on the throne of David. There's examples of that in Isaiah and Jeremiah. We're told that all nations will be blessed through Abraham. This is a way that they will be blessed through Abraham, through Jesus Christ. Genesis 49 says the scepter will not depart from Judah. And this supports that. And then Micah 5.2, from Judah will come ruler over Israel. There's probably more in there, but this is four of them that I, I wanted to mention just in the first section of the first chapter. From other study of uh, the New Testament, when the Jews read this or when the Jews were looking at these prophecies, what can we infer that they were expecting? They were expecting an earthly king. Absolutely. That was one of the things that made it so difficult to, yeah. to accept. All right, let's move on to the rest of the, the first chapter and, and discuss the birth of Christ. Again, this is familiar. The next few sections, remainder of the first chapter and the second chapter, should be very familiar because we had a series of lessons from the pulpit talking about the birth and the virgin birth, the visit of the wise men and the, the gifts that they brought. Let's read 
verses 18 through 25, and I'll, I'll read that so the, the folks streaming can hear us. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Very critical to our, our Christian doctrine and belief, this, this virgin birth and to, to convincing the Jews that, that he was the Messiah. This was just a, a tidbit I threw in there. It, it just amazes me that the word that has been here since the beginning, as we're told in John 1, came as a man for I, our I, sake. That one is hard for me. It's hard for me to understand specifically. I mean, like I get Jesus as a man, I get it, but God as a baby is, I can't, uh, it makes me smile. I can't quite wrap my head around it, right? Uh, and and that's, that's what I always think of when I, when I, when I am looking at this fact, right? right? So, so in, in human terms, we always think about the baby as being the symbol or the essence of purity. God is, in fact, the essence of purity. Yeah. So maybe that's the yeah. way to look at it. You know? yeah. The other thing that's interesting is, is uh, when we did the Vision Sunday, we talked about Mary in Luke chapter 1 uh, and about the challenge that she was given and that kind of thing. And, and you mentioned earlier that, that Matthew's account of the genealogy focuses on the path through Joseph. And you'll also notice that, that these verses are telling the story of Jesus' birth from the perspective of Joseph. And if you go to Luke's account, and the genealogy just after that, it's told from the perspective of Mary. Yeah. Uh, there. So the, the genealogy and the account uh, from the perspectives are, are similar. And I always, to the, the uh, and for those online, uh, we made a mistake. We were saying the genealogy was in Mark. Uh, uh, people uh, in the audience caught our error there. It is actually that genealogy is in Luke. Um, but uh, I like what you said about it's from the perspective of Joseph. And one thing I always ask ask myself, especially uh, as I read as Robert was reading there um, down in verse 19, what does it tell you about Joseph that? You know, he was a man who had a right to take an action under Jewish law, right? He could have put her away. He could have disgraced her. But what does it say about him that he had decided he wasn't going to do that, right? He was going to, he was going to allow her to, to have some dignity. What does that tell you about him as a man, right? That's, that's what I think about. That's what, what I wanted us to think about with that, that bullet. Put yourself in his shoes with what he knew at the time. This lady that you were betrothed to, which was a strong commitment then, it was like being married. So, um, and she turns up pregnant. What are you going to think? What position did that put him in? Yet he was still handling it very well, which was a great example of Proverbs eleven thirteen, which says he that is faithful of a faithful spirit can seal up the matter. Well, Matthew talks about being a just man. Yes. yes. Yeah. So have a lot of respect for Joseph. 
And then it's interesting that the angel of the Lord announced that conception and named him. So we'll stop right there, finish up chapter with two. two. And then if you'll read and three and four for next week, we won't go any further than four uh, next week. At the rate we're going, we probably won't get all the way through three, but <laughs> well, maybe we'll speed up the yeah. rate a little. We won't have the fire. Thanks for being here. Thank Thanks for those streaming online. If you have any questions, uh, bring them to us anytime during the week or next week at class.